No human being lived in the area of present-day England until after 4000 BC because it had been covered by ice for the previous 50,000 years. Soon after arriving in 4000 BC, people began building Stone Age by 3100 BC. Large stone monuments were built by prehistoric farmers in many regions of the world. Each group would cheer their mutual accomplishment. Forming to 5,000 years to slowly spread from Mesopotamia to Northern Europe. European farming villages typically had a head person and a group of elders who made decisions by consensus. The largest village contained 50 houses and 300 persons. From 3000 BC until 600 BC, European farmers utilized the slash, burn, and abandon system in which land was cleared to be farmed and then abandoned after a few harvests. After 600 BC, farmers began using a two-field system in which one field would be planted in alternating years while the other was left unplanted to give it one year to recover. The farmers would stay in one location for several generations, living in wattle and daub homes that they might share with their livestock. Wattle stit comprise this fence. Such stits are covered in mud when forming the wall of a house. An ox would be used to drag a metal pointed stick along the ground to allow sowing. Harvested grain was ground between stones and then made into bread. For those of us humans living in 7th century Europe, this was our way of life, passed from one generation to the next. Throughout Europe, there was an abundant land, but few persons, only 2 to 5 persons per square kilometer. By 50 BC, the Romans forcibly expanded into Europe. In his book, The Gallic Wars, Julius Caesar describes his military battles with the native tribe of Europe which you might like to compare to the forcible expansion of the latter European nations into North and South America. The Romans introduced peace. The mobore plow that turned the soil and built roads between Rome and its outposts in rural, cityless Europe. The Romans also brought 50 acres, which is 200 hectares, of serf or slave manned manors or plantations. The serfs would work both their own land and that of the plantation lord too. The lord lived in some manor houses. Some manor houses had water moats to keep livestock inside and predators outside. After the Roman Empire dissolved around 450 AD, European roads, towns, and trade decayed. Many southern European plantation lords became entangled in a feudal system of mutual aid obligations. Christianity arrived in England in the 5th century AD, just as Islam was about to spread across northern Africa. Christianity and Islam spread more quickly than had farming. The majority of the manors were not fortified towns or castles, but small farming villages. The system of Lord's Manor spread northward, arriving in France in the 9th century. Invading from Norman France in the year 1066, William the Conqueror imposed the manorial system in England wherever it did not already exist. What did William conquer? England had only 18 towns having a population of more than 2,000 persons. The earlier Anglo-Saxon and Danish invasion of England occurred after Rome's departure and brought waves of immigrants who left enduring customs. The Roman or Norman conquest instead brought small power groups. These two sorts of invasions of either population or power groups have occurred throughout the world. The first Norman king missed manor lord to ensure that no lesser subject held all the land of any region. The first to be permanent towns of Northwest Europe were built in the 10th century AD. It consisted of a wooden church and a stone manor house. Through the centuries, the wooden churches were built in stone. Many of these earliest permanent towns are Europe's largest cities today. Monkstown, or Munich, Germany, was first established as a Benedict monastery, and Dublin, Ireland began as a 9th century Viking camp.
Nearly all of the villages had a population under 500 people. Only 10% were larger. In the year 1086, the King of England ordered a survey, known as the Doomsday Book, of the homes and wealth of England so that he could arrange for efficient tax collections when he needed money for war. The survey records 1,300 villages and 275,000 households for a total population of 1.5 to 2 million people. 6,000 water mills are listed in the survey. The mills were used to grind grain. Within the medieval English village, the Lord lived in a stone house while peasants lived in a wattle and daub home. Each house occupied a small plot surrounded by a hedge, fence, or ditch, and had vegetable, herb, and spice gardens. Every village had a communal water well from which each family obtained their daily water, where extra gossiping could occur. To have hot water, one pot full might be kept heating on their hearth throughout the day. Homes had no privy. Instead, people would walk a bow shot from the house. Each home contained a single generation from a single family. Clans had been important in early centuries, but by now they had dissolved. The Crutch House soon arrived from the continent, but roofs continued to be thatched for centuries, even in London. This roof contained all sorts of insects, birds, and rodents, and easily caught fire, but was cheap and easy to make. Some people might sleep in a house loft. Houses were usually 3 by 4 yards or meters inside, but some were 15 yards or meters in length and had people and their animals staying on opposite ends. Animals and children wandered freely through the home's open door. Homes sometimes had shuttered windows, which might be covered with wax cloth but not expensive glass. And homes had dirt floors covered with a straw or rushes and scented flowers during the spring. Peat or wood was burned on a stone hearth. And the resulting smoke exhausted through a simple hole in the roof. Some hearths were raised for safety. The fireplace might be covered with a ceramic lid at night. Cooking was done indoors over the open fire. The hearth also provided heat and most of the light. People sat on benches and ate on a trestle table dismantled after meals. While eating, pairs of persons shared a soup bowl and drinking cup. Menors dictated that spoons should not be left in the bowl, that soup be eaten without slurping or burping, and that people wipe their mouth, but not their nose, with the tablecloth before drinking out of a shared cup. In 13th century China, citrus fruits were common food, and they were 13 types of peaches. In 13th century Europe, citrus fruits were a rare treat, and there was no coffee, tea, rice, chocolate, potatoes, tomatoes, spaghetti, noodles, squash, corn, baking powder, or baking soda. These New World and Eastern foods had not yet reached Europe, nor were there any paper products of any kind in Europe. Instead of using one name only, people began adding new and descriptive last name, which might indicate their occupation, a personality trait, or the location of their home. For example, a person who lived near the well or the village green might be called John Atwell, or Robert Green. Other last names might be Wise, Tanner, Fuller, or Smith. Marriage, Birth, and Childhood Many couples conceived before marrying in order to know for certain that they were both capable of doing so before becoming committed for life to a barren spouse. The manor lord would charge women, but not men, a fine of six pennies when caught having premarital sex. Yes, they were actually taxing sex. When persons being married owned land, 
The Lord collected a merchant fee from the newlywed. Marriage ceremonies often consisted of a kiss and a promise. Since this allowed too much room for future debate about that promise, Pope Alexander III set rules for ex exchanging wedding vows in public. He did this just before year 1200 AD. These vows were often done at the door of a church and were followed by a feast and a dance. To be married, a woman was expected to be at least 12 years old, and her husband was to be at least 14. Wedding ceremonies became more elaborate through the centuries. The priest would ask if anyone knew a reason that the couple could not be married. For example, due to a blood relationship of less than the fourth degree, counted the bride's first three fingers by saying the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and then placed a ring on the bride's fourth finger. It was believed that a vein connected that finger with the heart. At the end of the ceremony, the priest would kiss the groom, who would in turn kiss the bride. Wedding vows were beginning to be legally verified by witnesses. Licenses became mandatory under the Marriage Act of 1753. In the city, shop owners would have a gargantuan wedding feast with entertainment by magicians, acrobats, jugglers, and musicians. The musicians might be playing the newly invented six-stringed lute or the five-stringed viol. Both were tuned in fourths and fifths and accompanied by other instruments. The Lord also fined persons committing adultery and sent the case to further prosecution by the court of the church. Divorce was more common among aristocracy than among villagers and was usually due to either barren or bad marriages. Mothers gave birth from a crouching position, as continued to be done in 19th century North America. Childbirth was dangerous for both the mother and the child, and the infant remained especially vulnerable to disease during its first year of life. While a woman was giving birth, Men were excluded from the room. To aid the delivery, every door and drawer was opened within the house. All knots were untied and placed nearby. Was the foot and dry blood of so-called crane, which was more likely a gray heron. Catholic priests discouraged the use of magical incantations. Some believed that twins occurred when their mother had two lovers. One astrologer said that such multiple births were normal and predicted that if a woman gave birth to a seg of seven babies, she would have three boys, three girls, and one hermaphrodite. Birth defects were attributed to supernatural causes. Children were born at home with the aid of a midwife who quickly rubbed the newborn with magic ointments and salt and then wiped its gums with honey. If the mother died before completing the delivery, the midwife was to cut the baby out and attempt to save its life, or at least to baptize it. If nothing but its head emerged during the unsexful delivery attempt, it could still be baptized. The newborn was then washed, sometimes swaddled. Its godparents were summoned, and it was carried to the church by a female relative for full baptism, lest it die in a state of original sin. Parishes began keeping written birth records in the 15th century. The occasion was then celebrated with a feast in which the home's best material possessions were displayed for all to see. The mother of the newborn was not to make bread, cook food, or touch holy water, and she was not to enter the church building for several weeks after giving birth. She was then churched as had been Mary by carrying a lighted candle to church while wearing her wedding clothes. The priest met her at the door and sprinkled holy water on her. If she had died during delivery, then her midwife took her place in the churching ceremony. When leaving the church, if she had happened to glance at either a small boy, an evil person, or a person with a defect, then it was believed that her next child would be a boy, an evil person, or one with the same defect. Why did the medieval European do these things? They would answer, because it has always been so.
In the village, children were nursed by their own mothers, but wet nurses were often used for children born in the city or castle. Wet nurses were sweetened with gifts, but might also be blamed for the baby's illness. If the baby became ill, a doctor would give medicine to the wet nurse. Children were strictly disciplined and given physical punishment, but they were also indulged. Dolls were made of wood or baked clay. Tops, horseshoes, and marbles were used for toys. Children played prisoner's base and blind man's bluff, and they would bowl, swim, wrestle, and play dice, checkers, and forms of football and tennis. Ice skates were made from horse ribs. Infants under one year of age were left alone in the home while their parents worked. Toddlers were watched by a neighbor's girl. Small children played while others worked. Teenagers were doing the same work that adults were doing. In 1486, the Parliament of Scotland required landowners to send their eldest sons to school to study Latin, arts, and law. This was meant to ensure that the local government lay in competent hands and made schooling compulsory for the first time in the world. When people became too old to work, their children supported them by working their parents' land. When aging persons had no children to do this, they might contract someone to work the land in exchange for a portion of the income. Monks received a daily pension of two loaves of bread and two gallons of ale. Lay people might choose to purchase this pension. In the city, some old people died begging in the streets. When death was close, a priest would be summoned. The priest would be preceded by a person carrying a lantern and ringing a bell. If the priest said the last rites to the dying person, and then that person survived after all, he or she would be expected to go barefoot and abstain from sex until death did come. Upon death, the body was washed and sometimes covered with linen and then sewn into a deerskin cover. The door of the deceased home was draped in black and a town crier announced the time of the funeral. The deceased was then wrapped in a shroud covered with a black cloth and carried to the church on a two-poled bier. At the cemetery, Mass was said and a sermon might be given before the person was buried in a plain wooden coffin. Some persons were buried without any coffin. A tombstone was laid flat on the ground. Poor persons attended the funeral with lighted candles and received donations from the loudly mourning family. The funeral would likely be followed by drunken fun, despite complaints from the church. After a few years, bones might be dug up and stacked so the burial plot could be reused. Inheritance could be complicated. Land usually passed to the oldest son, or if none, then to the oldest daughter, or split among multiple daughters. If the oldest son was a minor, then the manor took him in until he reached legal age. If no children existed, then the land went to the brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and cousins. If there were none of these, then the manor sold the deceased land to a villager. If the oldest son died still a minor before taking possession of the land, then it instead went to the father's brother. A person's best animal had to be given to the Lord as an inheritance tax. Widows legally received one-third to one-half the land, but often owned all of it. Peasant women inherited, bought, sold, and leased land. The oldest son had to wait for his father to die before he possessed the assets enabling him to marry. Since younger sons were not inheriting, they instead became soldiers or paid a fee to the Lord to enter the clergy. This single, large fee 
was meant to make up for the many smaller fees that would have been paid had the person remained on the manor. Some fathers bought small plots for their younger sons. Other sons became an apprentice in a city, and the rest became day laborers, earning pennies a day. Each season included holidays during which work was suspended, meat and cheese were eaten, stories and music were heard, and games were played. Adult games included archery, plow races, wrestling, football, team games with sticks and balls, cockfighting, bowling, checkers, Backgammon, Blind Man's Bluff, Cards, and the much favored dice games and chess. The game of chess was taking on its current form instead of having two kings per side per feudal ideas. Young women held village men in prison until they paid a fine to get out. On the next day, men held women prisoner. There was no continental-wide calendar as each city followed its very own, even disagreeing on which year it was. Many Christian holidays were essentially unchanged pagan celebrations appropriated by the church. For example, November 1st was All Hallows Day, which was an old pagan rite meant to perpetuate the spirits of the dead. Other celebrations also included older pagan elements. During the Feast of Circumcision, the minor clergy wore their vestments inside out, held their books upside down, led an ass into church, interrupted services with shouts of hee-haw, and then sang and danced in the streets. During the Festival of the Holy Innocents, choir boys exchanged places with bishops and officials and conducted services. Greek and Roman theater had been completely forgotten. Here is a depiction of courtly love from the year 1310. Through the years 1000 to 1300 AD, peasant dress changed little. We wore a belted tunic, stockings, hood, gloves, and leather shoes with wooden soles. But the dress of the nobles changed much during the same period, going from loose, long garments to short, girded jackets, trailing gowns, voluminous sleeves, elaborate headdresses, and pointed shoes for women. While the clothing of the rich included many articles and accessories, extravagance in peasant clothing consisted of nothing but fur-trimmed sleeves. Metal coins originated in Lydia in the 7th century BC, and paper money already existed in China. Throughout medieval Europe, coins of various sizes and copper-silver mixtures were minted by various princes and bishops, and each coin had a value of one penny. A penny was called a pence in England, a denier in France, and a pfennig in Germany. Twelve pennies make a shilling, and twenty shillings make a pound. These names were given to multiples of pennies, but no such higher denominations were actually minted until a 12 penny shilling or grosso was made in Italy. In France, 20 denier was called a lever. England still uses LB as the abbreviation for the Latin word for pound. Wholesalers were beginning to use cash, but the villages of the world operated through the bartering of goods and services for another 500 years. The office calculating board consisted of lines of counters made of bone. Different lines were used to count each of pennies, shillings, and pounds, that is, multiples of ones, twelves, and twenties. Records were kept on tablets, but important correspondence was written on parchment, which was made from sheepskin and sold in 8-inch or 20-centimeter wide strips that would be sewn end-to-end -end into long strips. Egyptian papyrus was made from dried grass and leaves, 
Vellum was made from calf skin soaked in lime. And in China, paper was made from cloth. Knowledge of cloth-based paper eventually came to Europe through Arab traders. A villain, which is England's word for serf, was classified by the amount of land that he or she owned. Those who owned 30 acres, or 15 hectares, which is enough to feed a family, were called vergators, while those owning half that much were classified as half vergators. About 20% of peasants were vergators, one third were half vergators, and the remaining half held less than 10 acres of land, which was too little for a subsistence. Only the vergator, with 30 acres or more, grew enough food for subsistence. The others did not. Only those villagers owning more than 50 acres had a good surplus to sell. Each villain was required to work many days per year for the village lord. Vergators owed 117 days per year, while half vergators owned 58.5 days. A day's work was defined in terms of the harrowing or winnowing of 30 sheaves of barley or 24 sheaves of wheat or carting goods or hay or carrying a specific amount of eggs, hay, cheese, hens or geese or collecting a bag of nuts, working in a vineyard or making a hedge of a specified length in the field. Persons who owned land but had no labor tax were said to be freeholders. Typically, 32% of land was held by the Lord, 40% by villains owing labor services, and 28% by freeholders who did not owe labor services. If the manor lord sold his estate, he also sold the serfs with it. A serf could not move away from the manor unless he or she paid to the Lord one large fee meant to replace a lifetime's worth of smaller fees. The villain or serf was not free, but not exactly a slave either. They bequeathed and inherited property and land. They bought and sold land, usually in one to ten acre lots, but often less than an acre, and sometimes more. Some peasants bought land for their children, while others sought to acquire land that they could rent out to become a peasant landlord. The Doomsday Book of the year 1086 lists five categories of peasantry. Through the next few centuries, these categories became more numerous and complex, but mostly, the free became less free. By 1300 AD, it didn't matter so much whether you were free or unfree. A person's social standing was increasingly determined by the amount of land and the number of animals that he or she owned. The village was surrounded by its farmland, which was jointly worked by all the families of the village. But each family owned a strip somewhere within the whole. A typical village would have a few hundred persons working on harvest day. Some villages were now planting two or three fields. The community jointly decided when to plant, weed, plow, and harvest. Which fields would be used and which crops would be planted. Villagers planted mostly wheat because it was the most reliable crop and could readily be sold for cash to residents of nearby towns. The community also decided when to let the farm animals eat the stubble within the plowed fields and when the animals would be pastured. The Lord typically owned one-third of the farmland, which might also consist of many strips among the whole or might be separate from all the others. Yields per acre were one-third to one-half today's value. The use of manure as fertilizer was understood but little was used because few animals could be supported by the available feed. Every cow, horse, and ox eats as much grain as the several persons. Each home had a garden in which they grew beans, peas, and other vegetables, and maybe some herbs and medicine. Since wheat sales were used to pay the manor lord, peasants ate little of the wheat they grew. For their own consumption, peasants planted lesser quantities of rye, barley, and oats. This means that the manor lord and the people living in the town were eating better than where the villagers who grew the food. 
in the 13th century, 10% of the population of Europe was living in towns. To plant crops, a family would walk through the field tossing handfuls of seeds from a bucket and would be fined by the Lord for using too much seed. Seed was exchanged between manors and our 10,000-year-old continuing attempt to improve crops. After the villagers harvested a field, the poor were allowed to gather what they could from its stubble. After cutting grain, it then had to be gathered, bound, stacked, hotter, or carried to the barn, threshed with a flay, and winnowed by tossing in the air, as we saw was done in ancient Mesopotamia. The village church received 10% of each farmer's crop placed in Hyth barn. All villagers were required to grind their grain in the Lord's water-powered grinding mill, bake their bread in the Lord's oven, and pay a fee for these monopolized services. Peasants would be fined for grinding their own grain at home. The villagers were also required to repair the Lord's mill whenever it broke down. The Lord collected rents, fines, and fees from the people living within his land. For example, Fines were collected for stealing the Lord's peas, hay, or crop stubble, or for wounding a person. Fees were paid for marriage licenses and inheritance taxes. The Lord sold in town produce collected as rent from the manor peasants. By the year 1300, some lords made an effort to adopt a new cash manner of doing business and collected half of rents in cash rather than in labor or in bartered goods. The daily diet of every villager included ale, pottage, and numerous four-pound loaves of maslin bread, which is a mixture of rye and either barley or wheat. Pottage was cheaper than bread and required no milling or baking fees. Pottage is made by allowing barley grains to sprout in a warm, damp place, boiling the result along with anything available, including these. The geese explained that anything that grew went into the pot. Sometimes pottage would be fermented into beer. Brewing was done by women in their own home. When a batch of ale was ready to drink, an outdoor sign would be hung and the home would temporarily become a tavern. A favorite pastime of the villagers consisted of meeting and drinking at someone's home. Three gallons of beer sold for one penny. The village ale taster had to first verify the quality of the batch and charge a fee for its sale. The manor held a monopoly on grain grinding and on bread baking, the staples of life, but only collected frequent fines for weak and poor quality ale or for selling ale before the village official had tested it. The manor also placed limits on the price of ale. Most village families own little more than a standard seg of farming tools. Some owned a wheelbarrow or a cart for carrying tools and such, and some owned a plow or wooden harrow made from tree branches. The Lord's harrow had metal teeth. Some families owned various animals used to earn money and provide food. Geese could produce five offspring per year. A cow gave 100 to 150 gallons of milk per year, which sold for half a penny per gallon. Sheep were worth one or two shillings each. Each sheep gave fleece, milk, manure, and might be eaten. A single pig could give birth to 15 piglets per year, which could be eaten when they were two years old. The pigs of villagers were allowed to roam the forest to eat nuts and such, but only if their owners paid a fee to the Lord. Some families kept chickens and ate their eggs. Fewer families had a milking cow. Peasants ate little meat and cheese. More animals were sold for cash to pay a rent than were eaten. Dried fish or eels were expensive, or poached from the mill pond. 
This was a low calorie, low protein diet, and also lacking in calcium, lipids, vitamins A, C, and D. Villagers were lean. In medieval Europe, as for farmers everywhere throughout the last 10,000 years, people ate a limited variety of food and it became scarce each year in early spring. The Guise explained that a medieval housewife would simmer pottage or milk if it was available. She made soap with ashes and water so she could do laundry with such scrubbing and beating. She might dash outside to tend to her crying child and then return to find the cat at the bacon, the dog at the hide, her cake burning on the hearth, her calf licking the milk, pottage boiling over the fire, her husband scolding the churl. Some contemporary writers recommend the life of a nun over that of a housewife. A home contained the family's 20 possessions. Chairs were rare. A cupboard or hutch held wooden and earthen bowls and jugs. Clothing, tablecloths, bedding, and towels were stored in chests. Spoons were usually wooden. Thick slices of day-old bread might be used for plates. Hams, bags, and baskets were hung from the rafters to be kept from rodents. We slept on straw pallets. Few peasants had silver spoons, brass pots, and pewter dishes. Families would have to wait four more centuries before our industrial revolution began, around the year 1760, to fill our homes with cheap utensils and decorations and increase the number of household possessions from 20 up to 200. But it also decreased community ties. The farmers of the village made their own agricultural decisions. The Lord did not make these decisions, but simply demanded that the peasants produce his share of the village crop. The Lord prospered only if the villagers prospered and was the exploiter and beneficiary of the labor of the villagers. Through the year, two-thirds of the Lord's work was performed by hired help. The remainder was done by serfs performing their labor taxes, much of this during harvest. On the singularly crucial harvesting day, the Lord conscripted or hired everyone in sight. A small staff was regularly employed by the village lord, including plowmen, drivers, cart operators, cow herders, swine herders, a cook, a woman who milked ewes, a dairy person, some seasonal help, and day laborers. These laborers were paid double near harvest time and were usually tenant renters who lived on the village and owned no income producing land. Sometimes they were itinerant workers. Out in the fields, about one in five sheep would die each year. To keep a close eye on the animals, the cow herder and swine herder slept in the barn along with the Lord's animals. The plowman repaired the plow equipment and took care of the plow animals, typically two horses and six oxen. On Saturday, the staff might be allowed to use the Lord's plow on their own holdings. If two villagers owned a plow, then every other villager would use those also. These persons cultivated by foot, using only a spade. A large abbey might employ 80 persons. One popular guidebook recommended that sick animals be quickly sold while another recommended paying for treatments. An old ox would be eaten so it could be sold for 90% of its original cost of 12 shillings, but old horses were not eaten and sold for only half their original cost of 10 shillings. The guidebooks contained advice on butter and cheese production, animal husbandry, animal feeding, and early termination of the milking cows and ewes in order to encourage early breeding and the branding of the Lord's animals to distinguish them from those of peasants. A guidebook asked the timeless question, how profitable are your plow and stock? A single village might be part of one, two, or three different manors. 
Some villages included a sub manor in which one person had tenants of his or her own. Sometimes a lord would lease a manor to another person who hoped to receive more income than was paid in lease. Subletting was forbidden in some religions. A tenant paid rent to the lord in some mixture of labor, bread, ale, eggs, cheese, linen, wool, cloth, handicraft items, and cash. Both tenants and the lord sold crops for cash in a nearby town. Villager fines were always paid in cash to the lord. A villager could buy an annual license or pay a fee when caught to live outside the manor. This is the reason villagers were said to be unable to leave the Lord's land. Those who lived for a year within a city were then free of the Lord. In Germany, the saying went, A year and a day in a city makes one free. A Lord might take advice from one of the popular guidebooks for estate management, such as Walter of Henley's Husbandry or Rules of St. Robert by Robert Grossetest who also advocated making measurements to test Aristotle's description of nature. Larger lords held 50 manors and thousands of serfs. Since lords often held several manors and lived away, they needed a good managerial team on site. The lord sent a steward to visit each manor a few days per year to check the accounts. Rents, fees, and labor services were supervised, enforced, and collected by the bailiff and reeve. Daily operations of the manor were handled by the bailiff, who lived in the stone manor house and reported annual totals of income and expenses, along with grain and other inventory figures. Since most bailiffs were illiterate, they tracked manor accounts by making notches in sticks. These sticks would be given to the visiting steward who made detailed written records on parchment. The bailiff had several duties. He supervised the pinning of the lord's livestock, the formation of plow teams, and ordered the repair of the lord's mills and fences. On some manners, the bailiff also collected rent from the villagers and tracked totals for labor services performed by each tenant. The bailiff maintained supplies of iron, Wood, nails, millstones, horseshoes, carts, cart wheels, axles, iron tires, salt, candles, parchment, cloth, dairy, and kitchen utensils, slate, thatch, quick lime, verdigris, tar, quicksilver, baskets, livestock, and the staff's food. Most supplies were obtained from a nearby town. The manor was not self-sufficient. The bailiff subordinate was the reeve. The modern word sheriff derives from sheer reeve. Reeves were paid in non-cash benefits. For example, they might be allowed to eat at the lord's dinner table and graze their animals on the lord's pastures. On some manners, the reeve did not have to perform any of the usual villagers' farming labor. In the Canterbury Tales, one of Chaucer's characters was a reeve who stole from his lord. Each day the reeve saw those villagers owning labor services arrive for work and accomplish the necessary tasks. A villager would be fined for a missing a day. A villager might sometimes choose to pay that fine to obtain a day off work. A sick person was allowed to miss work for up to one year, but after that the sick person had to pay the wages for his or her replacement. The reeve had an assistant called by various names, including Beetle Hayward or Messer. The duties of his assistant were to find villagers whose animals strayed into the Lord's pasture, to preserve seed savings from last year's crop, and to help the reeves supervise sowing, plowing, mowing, and reaping. The villagers elected the bailiff staff, including the reeve, who was always a serf or villain. Members of the few most respected families were most often elected to these village positions throughout the century. These same families were most often filing court disputes too.
William the Conqueror codified laws common to all the land, but medieval law existed midway between the clan just and the modern legal system consisting of the precise interpretation and administration of justice. Medieval courts questioned witnesses to determine guilt or innocence, but the king and queen maintained certain centuries-old Anglo-Saxon traditions. For example, the king and queen might confiscate the property of a murderer. Medieval law was a mixture of scripture, oral tradition, Roman and Germanic law, church decree, and papal legislation. The legal scholar Groschen worked in the 12th century to merge and reconcile these components and to pre-select right and wrong in specific situations. The Lord, Church, and King each held their own prophet-seeking courts. Cases involving murderers, professional thieves, and rapists were held in royal court, which collected the fines and fees from those proceedings. Minor cases involving serfs and villains were held in the court of their local manor. Free persons instead went to the royal court. Cases involving clerics always went to the court of the church. Sometimes an accused person would run to a church to ask for asylum, but when asylum was obtained, it served only as a temporary having before that accused person would be expelled from the land. Sometimes an accused person would begin studying for the clergy just to take advantage of a lighter treatment of the church towards its own clergy. Peasants convicted of murder would be hanged, which really meant that they were slowly strangled under their own weight, but wealthy persons were instead beheaded in a quick death. Tradition called for the principal accuser either to personally carry out the death sentence or to hire another person to do it. Some murderers survived the bungled attempts of novices who were trying to carry out the death sentence. A condemned man was sometimes allowed to fight in the king's war instead of being executed. Occasionally, an influential friend of a condemned person won a royal pardon. Prisons did not exist. Fines were paid either in money or by working a specified period of time. Castle basements and the larger cities did have jails where defendants might be placed while awaiting trial. A poor person convicted of a minor crime might be held there for a short time and released. Trial by combat or ordeal was condemned by the church in the year 1215 as being meaningless. Cruel executions were done in the cases of heresy, treason, or witchcraft. Mutilations would become less frequent, but a thief might still be branded or lose a thumb or ear, rapists would be castrated, and harsh assailants might be blinded. Torture would be applied if a defendant wouldn't otherwise speak. A person would be tortured by pulling his or her teeth, by burning, or by being stretched on the rack. Eventually, we would decide that mutilation and public hanging brought the public down to the same level as a criminal. It was the custom of the land for a person in danger to call for help. All who heard were required to respond or be fined. For example, one might call for help if being struck or about to be struck. The respondents to that call would take the offender to the bailiff, reeve, or beetle. But this call would not be made lightly, and the caller was expected to have witness who could verify the need for a call. If both adversaries called, then it was later decided who had been justified. A meeting was held in the hall of the manor twice each year to conduct the Lord's business. Fees and fines were collected, labor dues were enforced, manorial officers were elected, and heirs were granted their property. During these meetings, civil and criminal court was also conducted to hear non-murder cases. Assaults occurring within the victim's home and those that caused bleeding were seen to be especially serious. Cases between villagers might involve public slander or unpaid loans of grain or equipment. Interest was charged despite being discouraged by the Catholic Church as usury. Usury is also discouraged in Islam. In the Manor Court, the villagers acted as prosecutor, witness, judge, and legal authority. This meant that the village tradition would be followed rather than written law specified from above. A handful of villagers would gather evidence describe the custom violated, judge the outcome, and then assess fines and damages. The entire village endorsed the findings of the jury, which meant that there would be a general feeling that justice had occurred. The villagers personally knew the people involved in the case and the circumstances of the event. 
In fact, they would have been discussing the case since the moment it occurred. An accuser was expected to bring a handful of oath helpers to swear to the events and to the accuser's trustworthiness. When a case was initiated, both plaintiff and defendant had to find two persons guaranteeing their appearance in court and payment of the fines incurred. A Lord Steward oversaw the proceedings. A novice steward may have consulted the court baron. Court records were written in Latin or parchment. These records were kept because fine amounts formed part of the Lord's business enterprise. The Lord always received a share of the imposed fines and a share of any confiscated property. One of the two arguing parties would be required to pay the other party and the Lord for offenses committed. Accusers who did not prove their case had to pay a fine to the Lord. If the two parties settled out of court, then the Lord would still receive the appropriate fee. When settling out of court, the two parties had to decide the fee portions that each would pay. Other than rent, fees, and the required labor services, the Lord did not interfere with the daily lives of the villagers. The Gi state that the Lord was not an omnipotent tyrant exercising the power of life and death over villagers. Mostly the Lord was a person living off the efforts of the villagers whose lives would otherwise have been much easier. The villagers openly discussed politics, religion, and morality without fear of the Lord's wrath. The Gi's explained that the Lord relied on the menorah system to get laborers into the fields, money into their pockets, and meat and dairy products onto their tables. The villagers relied on the menorah system to limit their labor and food payments and to guarantee their homes, their grazing rights, and their strips of farmland. This was the European way of life for centuries, but in the menorah system, the Lord had the best chance for prosperity. If the Lord hadn't taken 117 of 365 days efforts from each peasant, the lives of those villagers would have been less precarious and more often prosperous. Feudalism united the elite or aristocracy of Europe in a hierarchical mutual aid society in which a greater lord granted land, a fief or fiefdom, to a lower lord or vessel. The greater lord received loyalty along with military and other services from the vessel, while the vessel received income from the granted lord. But this hierarchical feudal system did not directly involve the peasants who lived on the lord's manor, farming for the lord and themselves. Medieval European society consisted of feudalism of overlords and lords combined with manuralism of lords and peasants. There is a lot of local variation in the system, which lasted about 500 years, with both farm labor and military services becoming even more frequently converted into cash payments. The Magna Carta, or Greater Charter, was a feudal document like other lesser charters between lords and vessels, but this document is also considered to be the beginning of modern constitutionalism. Jill N. Claster explains that the Magna Carta began in 1215 when the nobles of England took advantage of the war-weakened condition of King John to limit his arbitrary excuse of power in terms of feudal obligations exceeded. It asserted that the king and queen were also subject to law not above it. The king and queen could not go beyond feudal customs without the consent of the royal vessels. If they were to try, then the vessel had the right to resist the unjust use of power. The barons were trying only to limit the power of the monarchy, not to do away with it. Claster says that it is significant that the barons acted as a group rather than as competitors, which they might have done hundreds of years earlier, but there was not yet a national self-consciousness. Anthony Black points out that the Magna Carta provided a means of redress against a bad government without having to resort to violence. Frederick here explains that the barons were in no way representing the people, only their own interests. Frederick says that the Magna Carta also asserts no man shall be taken or imprisoned or deprived of his estate or outlawed or exiled or in any way improvished, nor will we go against him or say anyone against him, except through the legal judgment of his equals or in the law of the land. That such a document was needed tells us that the royals had been doing these very things. We also see that such demands are easiest to make when a ruler has just been weakened. This means that the issues were to be decided by written law and not by the whims of the king and queen. In addition, the Magna Carta asserted that the rights of London and the other cities were to continue and that the Magnites had the right to assert to taxation and that the protection of foreign merchants would be provided.
we've seen that this same protection was expected in ancient Mesopotamia. In fact, a standing committee of 25 barons was to control the king and queen. Any four barons could raise a complaint that must be addressed. In the 13th century, similar documents were being forced in Hungary, Spain, and Poland. We see that these grievances were things only lords would complain about, not peasants. The Magna Carta was not an agreement between the people and the king and queen, but between lords and the king and queen. In the 1240s, these meetings between the ruler, who wanted to use the meetings as an instrument of government, and the barons, knights, burgesses, and barons who wanted to assert their rights, came to be called the parliament. The word parley had been used to describe any meeting between persons or groups. The king and queen now had to go through parliament to ask for money or troops. To counteract the constant pressure of the parliament, the king and queen sought to support of the burgesses and the town representatives who came to act as a single estate in the lower house of commons. In 1352, the parliament was separated into upper and lower houses. It is said that what touches all must be approved by all as feudal Europe moved towards democracy. The feudal and manorial system was fatally stressed by crop failures, like those of the years 1315 through 1317, by the population increasing plague of 1345 through 1350, and by the excessive war funding taxation imposed on the peasants, which resulted in the Peasant Rebellion of 1381. The manorial system of servitude dissolved through the 1400s in England and France. The ending of the feudal and manorial system worked its way south and east over the next few centuries. Serfdom was not allowed until the year 1850 in some Eastern European countries. The population of Europe doubled through the 12th and 13th centuries, but then decreased during the 14th century as large plagues and famine occurred. Famines began with rumors, hoarding, and black marketing, and ended with hordes of beggars and widespread disease for the weakened. The Guise state that during the famine of 1315 to 1370, theft of food and livestock rose sharply. Cats and dogs disappeared. Bodies of the poor were found in the street, and cannibalism was rumored. Around 1315, the plague reduced the population of Europe, decimated families, and left few laborers to attend to the Lord's crops. The Lord then enforced labor services with the threat of the stocks and by invoking the State of Laborers Law that the Parliament created in 1351 to prohibit wage increases and to forbid workers from leaving their home areas to search for improved conditions. The price of land dropped and that of labor increased, but the surviving peasants had extra food on a daily basis. This made some writers complain that the peasants had forgotten their well-ordered lower stations. By the way, today we understand that those persons having received a certain gene from both of their parents were resistant to the plague and that this very same pair of genes now appears to make one resistant to HIV. When the king and queen needed money, they might impose a tax of one-tenth or one-twentieth the value of each person's assets worth more than a small amount. Only the poorest would be excluded from this tax. During the 56th year reign, Henry III imposed this tax five times. During the next 35 years, Edward I and Edward II imposed this tax 16 times to pay for fighting the Scottish. Edward III imposed the tax 41 times while fighting the French. He also required that each village send and equip a number of men to fight against France. In 1377, an extra tax of 4 pence per person over age 14 was levied. This was followed in 1379 by another 4 pence plus 2 tenths of assets, and in 1381 by 4 pence plus 1.5 tenths of assets. Edward III demanded one third of everyone's wealth as he hoped to expand his own territory and wealth. What portion of your annual income today is spent on the nation's military? The Peasant Revolt of 1381 was the response of the peasants to the tax levies, labor service laws, and other irritants. This was a continent-wide revolt and was dominated by the better-off peasants because they could see greater liberty within reach of force. The more oppressed peasants could not. The aim of the revolt was the abolition of servitude. It began shifting control of the village economy from the lord to the peasants and allowed peasants to keep more of their own money and efforts for themselves. In England, 
John Ball complained that the, the toil of peasants provided the luxury of the lords. Ball may have been the first person known to write that all men are created equal, and that such servitude is against the will of God. Some peasants complain that they wore coarse cloth, ate rye bread, and slept on straw while lords wore velvet and ate spices and wheat bread. The Guise describe an argument between a villager and a knight who was showing little concern that his animals were wrecking about in a graveyard of lowly peasant bones. The villager pointed out that God made the bones of villagers and knights, and they were all indistinguishable after death. During the revolt, some manorial records were destroyed because they had been used to prove the legality of each person's servitude. Some lawyers were killed, but from then on, Records were used to instead prove the sanctity of the family's claim to their land because the records show that they lived there for generations. The uprisings were suppressed by the monarchy, nobility, upper clergy, and wealthy townspeople, but peasants won an end to the four pence tax and statue of laborers was from then on ignored. Labor services were relaxed. Through the next century, villains either bought their way free of the Lord's fees and fines or simply refused to pay them any more. The Guise state that the old feudal landlord class was given a devastating blow in 1536 as Henry VIII, fighting with the Catholic Church over his divorce problems, issued his dissolution of monastic orders. He violently suppressed the largest monasteries and seized their manors, which he then conveniently sold for 1.5 million pounds. Throughout the planet, and throughout history, the daily life of every farming villager was filled with laborious chores. This was also true for the medieval European farmer who had the added burden of the manorial system. Villains and serfs resented the labor dues mostly because of the time lost from fulfilling their own needs. People always break free of imposed class systems, though it usually takes centuries, because we feel that no person is better than anyone else, and we expect our society to be mutually beneficial for everyone. Anything less is an injustice. The villagers paid fees to the Lord in goods and labor services, while living life with little other intervention, setting their own agricultural schedule and settling their own quarrels. Free and unfree conditions had meaning, but not as much as we usually imagine today. Be more indicative of the level of obligations. The villagers had a poor diet, scant sanitation, simple homes and dress, and life-threatening conditions for children. But they also had lives of love and festival, games and ale, fun and fights, and they had neighbors whom they knew and depended on for plowing, harvesting, helping, and bearing court witness. The pressure to change the medieval way of life came through the growth in population levels and markets that resulted in some villagers leaving their land for nearby towns. The Guise explained that the peasants were not brutes or dolts, but people like us. They were living in an exploitative social system, still largely devoid of effective medicine and having a slowly changing technology, but they were becoming modern. By the 13th century, every village and manor had its own church. Each church district was called a parish. Often, a wealthy and enterprising person would have a church built to fulfill his or her own needs. This person would appoint a priest, pay the priest's salary, and receive the income from the church in the same manner as other private enterprises. Later on, a local villager might run that church and receive its income, which was one-tenth of the village's produce. Sometimes, a nobleman would hire a vicar to run the church and expect to receive its profits. One nobleman ran 24 churches this way and obtained a total annual profit of 2,200 pounds. In the year 1172, Pope Alexander III decreed that a vicar would receive one-third of the income. By 1300, there were 9,000 parishes in England. Some rectors were more concerned with income than in giving moral lessons. Some priests understood the teachings of Christ while others were mere parrots. Manuals for priests began to appear listing annual offices and describing ceremonies for baptisms, burials, and marriages. They also provided music, words for mass, and lessons from the lives of the saints. Celibacy was an ideal. Priests often had a wife. Most churches were one-room buildings that had no benches or pews. Some persons brought their own stool, while most people sat on the straw-covered floor. A few persons brought hand warmers consisting of hollow metal spheres containing hot coals. The largest church buildings 
contained relics from early Christianity, including pieces of stone from the Ten Commandments, the baby teeth of Christ, or the bones and clothes of saints. Three different churches displayed a thumb of John the Baptist. In 1287, Bishop Quinnell of Exeter recommended that the minimum church furnishings included a communion bread holder made of pewter, a silver chalice, a holy oil container made of pewter, an incense boat to hold the kiss of peace, three cruets, a vessel for holy water, images of the patron saint and the Virgin Mary, and a stone altar that had a canopy and cloth covers. Holy water was to be locked away to prevent it from being stolen for use in witchcraft. Over the next few centuries, many churches would be rebuilt in stone. Sermons have been given in Latin until the 12th century, but were now being conducted in English. Priests gave lessons about the articles of faith, the creed, the Lord's prayer, the seven deadly sins, and the Ten Commandments, and they described each and every corner of hell. Morals were illustrated with stories of animals, plants, stars, and body parts. Priests also gave practical advice about nursing, sexual morality, and marriage. They advised against usury and magic. Many lessons were drawn from history, legend, contemporary events, personal memories, the Bible, and the lives of the saints. Worship of the Virgin Mary began in the 4th century and was soon more popular than all the saints combined. Priests gave much instruction during confessions. The priests would ask many questions. Have you played or drank on Sunday? Have you sinned in lechery or tricked women in bed? Have you found and kept or borrowed and not returned something? Have you claimed another's deed, celebrated a neighbor's harm or grieved their fortune? Have you ate till you barfed? Have you been to church or listened to a sermon without devotion? Have you taught shrewish children some manners? Have you destroyed grain or rode through grain rather than having gone around it? The penis was to fit the offense without requiring more than could be accomplished. The life of the priest was to provide an example for everyone. He should be chaste, honest, mild, shaven, and sober, and be hospitable for the rich and poor. He was to avoid gluttony, sloth, pride, envy, taverns, games, dancing, and flashy clothing. Moral offenses were heard in the church's court. Adultery was the most common case. Those found guilty would be whipped, unless they were wealthy, then they paid a fine. The church also heard cases of marriage separations, proscribed penances for departing from the traditional posture during intimacy. Consolidation of beliefs and practices were still occurring in the Christian world. Some sects believe Christ was born through Mary's ear or that an imposter died on the cross in place of Jesus. Heretic variations in belief were fought by members of the Inquisition who traveled from town to town looking for informants. The heretics might be whipped, but usually were not tortured. Some exceptions include the dramatic public burning of 183 Cathars in the year 1239 in Montweimer, France. In the city, people had a less strenuous life than did village farmers. In addition, people living in the city ate a more varied diet. Both city and rural homes cultivated gardens providing herbs and medicines along with seasonal vegetables, fruits, and flowers. The people of the towns and cities obtained their food from the nearby farming villages. We've seen that food had to be obtained locally because it could not be transported over any distance at all until the last century or so. Towns contained chandlers, coopers, glaziers, tanners, and tailors, each whose shop was part of their home. They didn't have a separate building that served as a retail store, and said they might prop open a window shutter to serve as a sales counter. During subsequent centuries, craftspeople, not farmers, comprised the largest portion of Europeans emigrating to the New World. Each of these shops was operated by the owner with the help of his wife, one or two male relatives, and an apprentice in training. Shop signs displayed standard symbols to indicate their goods or services to a largely illiterate public. Apothecaries displayed gilded pills. Goldsmiths showed unicorns. Harness makers displayed horse heads. 
and surgeon barbers displayed red striped poles. Wine shops displayed a bush. Wine was sold straight from the barrel because bottles were not yet being made in Europe. Neither was champagne. Street peddlers sold things such as fish, chicken, fresh and salt meat, garlic, honey, wine, milk, onions, fruit, eggs, leeks, and pastries that were filled with either fruit, chopped ham, chicken, or cod, and were seasoned with pepper, cheese, or egg. Some craftspeople traveled from village to village selling various goods, or their repair of clothes, kitchen utensils, or furniture, or selling services such as slating, tiling, thatching, animal branding, sheep milking, animal shoeing, or animal tending. During mowing season, a pair of persons might travel around with their cart, offering carting services to hire. A tinker would repair brass jars and pans. Townspeople paid an annual fee to their lord instead of performing labor services. As the city grew, its lord became very rich. The lord of a farming village received much less income. Citizens typically paid a tax of 2.5% on movable property and 1% on real property, but the wealthiest paid a flat tax of 20 pounds. By the year 1250, a sales tax was added along with a per-person tax. These taxes were paid to the lord of the city, who in turn paid a share to his lord. Such shares were paid all the way to the king and queen at the top of the feudal hierarchy, who were now becoming heads of incipient nation-states. Townspeople collectively defended their rights by writing them down in a charter. A charter might record that the townspeople were to have a mayor and council and hold their own lower court. Some charters stipulated that a man could not own a crossbow unless his property was valued at over 20 pounds. In the U.S. today, there is a bit of debate about the original intent of the writers of their Bill of Rights guaranteeing the right to bear arms, and this may provide a clue. Townspeople were mostly left alone while the Lord was prospering. When not prospering, the Lord would increase taxation. Many towns were heavily taxed to finance the Lord's involvement in a profit-seeking crusade in the Holy Land. Sometimes those crusading lords paid a city-sized ransom when their armies were captured. One ransom was 300,000 pounds, which was paid to a certain sultan who was surprised by their lack of hag. Some town merchants expressed their opposition to crusading. It is a good and holy thing to live quietly at home, in friendship with neighbors, taking care of children and goods, going to bed early and sleeping well. They said they would happily pay for defense against a reverse crusade, but it is stupid to die at large expense in a foreign land. Townspeople had general liberty and some self-government, but little democracy. Mayors and council members were sometimes elected by guild members, sometimes appointed by ongoing members, and often came from a small number of families managing to monopolize these positions. For example, Half of the members of Venice's 480-person council came from just 27 families, and in Pisa, 30 families monopolized the council throughout the 13th century. The town court heard cases of petty theft, fraud, and assault, and disputes involving property or business transactions. The mayor and a handful of council members might act as judges, receiving portions of each fine and settlement. For example, a murderer would have to pay money to the victim's family. Some typical cases include the following. One man found his silver cup in the possession of another man, who proved he bought it from a third man. This third man could not readily prove how he got the cup, so he was placed in jail until more witnesses could be found. Another case involved a landlord's attempt to sell the doors and shutters of a house to recover rent that was passed due from its occupant. In another case, the neighbors of a woman took her to court to force her to clean up the foul-smelling pipe she placed between her privy and the street. She was fined six pennies and given 40 days to remove the pipe. Towns were becoming more numerous and their populations were expanding. In the year 1250, the most populous cities in Europe were located in Italy, where several cities had 50,000 persons and Venice had 100,000 persons. The largest cities of Northwest Europe were walled and had 10 or 20,000 persons. The population of Paris was 5,000 persons. Troyes had 10,000, Cork had 10,000, Landon had 25,000, and Ghent had 40,000. In contrast, we have seen that the population of Hangzhou, capital of the southern Song dynasty of China, 
was one million persons in the year 1275 AD. It was described by Marco Polo as the greatest city on earth. The population of Western Europe was about 60 million persons. The Low Countries were already draining marshlands and building dikes. In the 13th century, one dike burst in Holland, killed 50,000 people. Since buildings were made of wood, fire spread easily in the city, and attackers would burn everything they couldn't carry. Walled cities, as we saw was the case in Mesopotamia, were still protecting their residents from attack. A siege was often a battle of food supplies, as residents tried to hold out longer than their attackers, who could be fed in the field for only a couple of months. Catapults had already been used for 1,000 years, but were now becoming stronger through the use of counterweights. Attackers often tried to dig wood-supported tunnels under a wall corner. When the supporting wood was burned, the wall might collapse and provide an opening into the city. The city residents dug counter tunnels to fight this tactic. Towns were filled with shops, displaying goods to the people walking past. In contrast to today's cities, most everyone was walking. Few persons rode litters or carriages in town. Only nobles and the wealthiest business persons owned horses. Some less rich persons owned a donkey. Saddles were made from wood and might be ornamented with ivory, metal, or painted leather. Embroidered saddle cloths were used. European horses were being bred for size and so were already larger than those used in Roman times. Around town, one would see monks and priests wearing brown habits. Artisans wore bright green, red, blue, or yellow tunics and hose. While merchants wore fur-trimmed coats, housewives wore gowns, mantles, and white hats. In a fashion lasting for centuries, some women used face powders to present snow-white skin. The dirt or mud streets were filled with dogs, cats, geese, and pigeons, along with odors from trash, animal dung, fish markets, linen makers, butchers, and tanners. Residents were required to clean the street in front of their homes and shops. Each home had its own garbage pit and a privy out back. These were periodically emptied for a large fee. All buildings looked the same on the outside, but the homes of the wealthier contained more floors and were more elaborately furnished. Merchants, now called burghers or sometimes sire, often had their shops on the ground floor of their three-story home. They lived in the second floor while their servants lived in the third. The merchant might also have a stable or storehouse in the rear. Windows were nothing but oiled parchment that passed little light. An oil lamp might be suspended by chain and lit after dark. Animal fat was saved for the chandler to turn into candles or to be mixed with ashes to make laundry soap. Beds had a straw-filled mattress, feather-filled pillows, and woolen blankets. If a family could afford them, expensive spices including pepper, mustard, ginger, nutmeg, cinnamon, cannel, mace, and cumin were imported from the Orient and kept in locked chests. Some spices were more expensive than gold. Basil, sage, rosemary, thyme, marjoram, and savory might be grown in a house garden and hung inside the house to dry. Walls were covered with dyed or embroidered cloth. Soup was the standard meal and often included meat or fish. Sauces were then thickened with pestle ground breadcrumbs and stews were decorated with flower petals. Roses and primroses might be stewed for dessert. Recipes were complicated. Rabbits, geese, capins, ducks, and chickens were bought from a shop live with their feet tied together. Fish might be kept alive in a leather tank until dinner time. Food was preserved through pickling, salting, or smoking, or by being dried in the sun. Servants ate after their employers, and leftovers were taken to the door where one or more persons were waiting. In previous centuries, beggars were allowed inside to ask for food directly from the table.
Many of these persons had left their farming village. For a few pennies, a person could buy chicken, rabbit, vinegar, oils, salt, or pepper. Prices were higher for olive oil, sugar, or honey, so few homes had any sweeteners. The price and weight of bread was fixed by law and varied with local crop yields. Loaves were marked to indicate who had baked them. Bakers caught cheating were placed in the pillory with a loaf hung around their necks. While shopping, people took care to avoid being tricked by an unscrupulous business person. Some business people camouflaged stale fish with pig's blood, soaked cheese in broth to make it appear richer, or watered wine, milk, or oil to increase its volume. A standard joke involved a sausage maker's customer asking for a discount for years of loyalty, but instead being asked, are you still alive? Social status was just as important to the medieval family and shopkeeper as for humans everywhere today. Each family and each person sought respect in the community. Women were somewhat oppressed and exploited, as still occurs throughout much of the world. Women had no political voice in local affairs and could not serve in the town council. But there were some prominent women, including Eleanor of Aquitaine and Joan of Arc. Unmarried women could inherit, sue, make contracts, buy and sell property, and represent themselves in court. The church taught that a woman is subject to her husband, but not to his servant. Wife beating was common, but women also dominate their husbands. Privileged women had tutors and learned to read and write, speak Latin, and play musical instruments. They could have a more rounded education than their brothers, who mostly learned to ride, hawk, shoot, and play chess. Women were not allowed to attend the university. They could choose only to enter a convent, such as Notre Dame au Nonain, which was founded in the 6th century. Women operated the shop of their husbands when he was away or after he died. Women worked in many occupations, from seamstress to barber and carpenter, but always for a lower wage than men. In fact, guidebooks recommended hiring lower-cost women to increase profits. A contemporary poet described the characteristics of a lady. She should walk straight, saluting everyone she passes, including the poor. She should be careful not to mislead men with a glance or accept their gifts. She should not drink too much, nor cuss, scold others, or talk loudly. She may sing when asked. Bad breath should be held and bad teeth should be covered when close to other people. It was bad manners to talk while eating, to take the best pieces of food, or to criticize the food given by your host. She should knock before entering a home, and should not look inside while passing a home. Keep in mind that both Hangzhou in China and Cahokia in North America were contemporary to the 13th century Europe described here. It was full till, till there with cream yeah. and yeah, half an hour yeah. and it depends but it's not always half an hour because it depends on the cream and it depends on the weather. When it's warmer it goes faster and when it's colder it goes less fast and throughout the uh, cyclus of the cow's life when it had the baby the first cream is really different than after a month and after another month and after another month. So it will change throughout the year, or every cream is different and will take longer or less time. Okay. Did you twist the cream directly from the cow? Sorry? Did you take the cream directly from the cow, or is it no, changed I, somehow? No, no it's um, the cream, like milk. I think the milk comes from the cow, and I think the cream comes up if you let it stand for a little while. I need to double check that actually, <laughs> because, um, but it's, that's also a thing that just changes all throughout the year, you know. And of course, because I, I work here in the kitchen of the merchant's house, I don't have a cow, you know, we're in the middle of the city, so I don't have space for that, but uh, I would have bought that. It's really, um, 
in a city like this, you buy a lot of stuff. There's a lot of trade and you don't do everything by yourself. Even a big household like this, you know, you need to buy in stuff. We don't make our own fabrics, for example. That is a thing that we buy. How many people do you live in this house? We're with eight right now. Yeah. With a salesman. Sorry? The sales of the salesman? Yes, yes, of the merchants. Yes, yes. Merchant. So we're here with him, yeah. his mother, his brother, uh, the bodyguard of the... Yeah. Uh -huh. It is because actually the merchant got into a quarrel with a local Danish other merchant's son because he offended the Danish king so they're going to joust tonight to talk that anyway so if we have a guard we have a master of the coin and then we have three people of staff we have Marijn who is the, the kitchen boy we have Christy who is the the, 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 the assistant to the missus and um, and me and I work in the kitchen so, but today we have a lot schools books and education. There were no public schools educating the general population. The daughters of the wealthy could be taught only by a private tutor, but their sons could receive primary education from a parish priest and then secondary education at a cathedral school. To train clerics, the church founded cathedral schools in the seventh century, but the instructing priests were simply training their own replacements. Students sat on the floor during class and used bone, ivory, or metal tools to gouge notes on wax tablets. Pupils repeated the instructor's words in unison until they had memorized a topic. Each morning, students recited what they had learned the previous day. This was followed by a discussion period and then a new lesson. Students laboriously copied books by hand in a chore that required months of effort. Each piece of parchment was first scraped, smoothed, and clamped, and then written on by dripping ink from an animal horn. The copyist often wrote a celebration on the last page. Finished, thank God, or may the writer be given a cow, horse, goose, or companion. Etiquette directed that books were too valuable to lay on a straw-covered floor, scratch with fingernails, be pounded on, or used to hit somebody. Ready to use books could be rented by a student. Rental fees were determined by the number of pages in the book. The original author of the work wrote giraffes on wax tablets and the final version on parchment. Students memorized passages from the Roman and biblical experts, Virgil, Ovid, and the Gospel, that they would frequently quote throughout the remainder of their lives. The points presented in every document and all written correspondence would be given weight by quoting these authorities. The G's explain that in some letters, as many as half its sentences might contain a quote from the ancient wise, letting them do the arguing for the letter writer. Universities for the general public began in the 11th century as priests began taking general students. These general students were most often the male sons of wealthy families. No schools yet existed in the villages. Eleven of the twenty-two universities of the twelfth century Europe were in Italy. The university had no buildings of its own. Classes were simply held in the homes of their teachers. Students enrolled at the age of fourteen or fifteen and were unsupervised at night. They would sometimes fight, gamble, drink, and spend their money on ubiquitous prostitutes. Such behavior led to fights with the townspeople. Sometimes, riots were incited. After six years of study, the student had to pass an exam. Students would then become a church official, receive a license to teach, become a scholar, or go on to study medicine or law. You might like to compare fields of study, career choices, and educational opportunities among the general population of ancient Mesopotamia, medieval Europe, and your own nation today. University students learn the three subjects, logic, Latin grammar, and public speaking or rhetoric, meant to build writing skills. History and literature were not taught, but they did learn arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Until universities began training more than church officials, these humanistic subjects 
were secondary to theology, canon law, and philosophy. Paul Johnson says the school in Mantua was teaching these humanist subjects by the year 1423. Some humanist pupils went from school to school seeking these new subjects. European scholars did not speak Greek in Dante's time, but by 1450, every respectable humanist spoke Greek. Some scholars began studying in Constantinople, where an evolved Greek was spoken. They often returned to Europe with previously unknown Greek words by Plato and others. Following the Reformation, which began in 1517, university students expanded to include history and poetry and such. Physical education, art, and the local language were not yet taught in the university, but we would soon begin to write down and study the grammar of French, English, German, and other languages. As the language is first written, that is when the sounds of its symbols and the spelling of its words are initially chosen. No science was taught in Europe until the knowledge of it began to arrive from the Islamic world. Arabic numerals, using decimal places and the zero invented in India, began to be used in Europe. As you've experienced, it's much easier to perform arithmetic using decimal rather than Roman numerals. Social science, chemistry, physics, and biology did not yet exist. For example, little was taught about plants and animals other than a few nonsensical rumors. Elephants fear mice, hyenas change sex at will, and ostriches eat iron. Sailors were beginning to use astrolabes and the Chinese compass to chart coastlines, but university students were still being taught that the Earth geography consists of only the three equally sized continents of Africa, Asia, and Europe. The scientific method would not begin for a few more centuries. In the history of Islam, Robert Payne says that around the year 800 AD, the Abbasid Caliphs Harun and al Mamun established universities and astronomical observatories and had scholars translating Greek, Syrian, Persian, and Sanskrit works. For example, al Farabi worked to harmonize Aristotle's ideas with the Quran. In turn, St. Thomas Aquinas studied Al-Farabi's ideas while attempting to put Christian beliefs on an Aristotelian foundation of reason. The written works of the Greeks were part of normal study in the Islamic world, but unknown in Europe until rediscovered through 12th and 13th century Latin translations of the Arabic versions of these books. To accomplish the translation from Arabic to Latin, Jewish scholars in Spain first made a rough translation from Arabic to Latin, and then the result was polished up by Christian scholars practiced in Latin. We can believe that inaccuracies would build through successive translations from Greek to Syrian to Arabic to Latin, and then to, for example, English. For centuries, books in Europe had been copied only by a small number of monks, but after sufficient growth in the market of readers, a new business emerged to hand copy books for sale to the wealthy public. People like to read stories aloud for entertainment at home. Books about the lives of the saints were especially popular, but there were tales of swindled or henpecked merchants, beaten wives besting their husbands, and romance, too. A woman named Portia was the heroine of the popular novel, The Hard Creditor. There was also the story of Flamenca, the wife of a jealous man. She managed to exchange two words each time she walked past a particular suitor on the street. Through the next several weeks, their conversation slowly built to yes. But after four months of love, she chose to stay with her husband and sent him away. During the 12th century, there was a popular story involving the adventures of a fox, a wolf, a cat, and a lion. For example, in one episode, the fox, who was stuck in a well, tricked the wolf into coming down on the other end of the well rope. As the wolf descended, the fox was lifted out of the well, leaving the now trapped wolf behind. Soon, the demand for books and the available mechanical knowledge combined into the invention of the printing press, as described below.
High population densities, poor sanitation, diets low in fruit and protein, and cold winters made for short lives. Only in the last few decades have we come to understand how easy it is to avoid such unnecessarily shortened lives. Pneumonia and typhoid killed many persons. Leprosy and leper colonies were common. France had 2,000 of them. Crippled people filled the roads on pilgrimage to holy sites. Hospitals were staffed by priests and nuns who tried to help those with simple sicknesses. The hospital did not take patients with leprosy or plague and did not handle pregnancies. Midwives helped deliver babies at home. Medieval medicine was not too effective, consisting of astrology, bloodletting, and herbal concoctions. Any quack could sell a remedy. Even the larger cities would have but a handful of licensed doctors who had completed eight years of training. Medical training included such practical advice as asking for payment while the patient is in pain and recovering all bases by telling one of the patient's relatives to expect a recovery while telling another to prepare for death. If a doctor returned and found yesterday's patient dead, the doctor was trained to avoid looking surprised and instead explain that he knew death would happen and just wanted to find out at which hour the patient had died. Trained doctors learned surgical techniques to correct cataracts and to deal with the hernias and kidney or gallstones. Opium or mandrake was used for anesthesia because they would make the patient sleep for four hours, not feeling knives or fire. Doctors were also taught that a good surgeon's cutting and burning is not hampered by the patient's weeping. The barber profession was becoming divided into hair cutters, blood letters, and tooth pullers.